Now, as I've mentioned concerning Ezekiel 38 and 39, I think the basic message of the passage is pretty clear cut. You know, you have a people that have been returned. They're dwelling safely in the land. And uh, Gog come, comes in a final attempt to possess the land of which in back in 36, we've just talked about how he's going to remove them. And he said back there, never again, never again will the people do this. Uh, I'm sure the nations thought, well, don't know about that. So as a, I can only see that this is a final declaration to the world at this point that I mean what I say. And we've had a lot of that in the book of Ezekiel. God wants them to understand what I say I do. And I've said this, and I want to encourage the exiles and those of the people of Israel who will read this. That I will restore the people. I will cleanse them. They will know the new covenant. They will come to know me. They will have the spirit of God within them. They will live in a prosperous land. And they will live in safety and security. And I will be their king. And I will be their ruler. And no, no one again will ever be able to possess the land. And this is my demonstration of that. I will even bring Gog upon the land though he will think it's his schemes and plans and, and I think you notice we got both of those in the right in the text both sides of the picture here and I will remove and demonstrate and and demolish Gog and the judgment will be great and we will have all of these uh, bodies here and we will have all of these weapons and so forth. A uh, question was raised, an issue was raised uh, in, in the, our break that uh, let me speak to holistically. By that I mean everybody here. And that's you know, the question that is very natural to ask. Uh, you mean in the end time they're going to be fighting battles with bows and arrows, clubs, and so forth? Uh, is that really what's going to happen? Is that, is that really it? Well, it's certainly possible because there have been situations where contemporary people have been decimated and you have to kind of start all over again. So to say it's impossible that they would, uh, that this would not be doing, you know, they could not do that with that type, with those kinds of weapons, I don't think we can ever say that. Uh, anything's possible with God. Don't don't ever put him in a box. That is within the nature of his character. Okay. But I think we have to realize that revelation is given to people so they can understand. Now, if the revelation here had been, well, now Gog will come with missiles and F-16s and so they, a what? You know, what's, what's that? You know, there were, it, this would make no sense. As far as that goes, hey, if, uh, if this actual restoration of the people of Israel, let's say, is another 100 years, now I'm just arbitrarily pulling a date, you know, out of the year, what kind of weapons they have then? You know, I mean, we, they may say, you know, you, can't, are they, are, you mean they're really going to, they're going to do this with missiles? And, you know, how antiquated can you get? So, I think God reveals himself, obviously, in that which people understand. But I think in a prophetic message like this, where you're talking about a war, and I'm not saying we're suddenly saying, well, these are clubs and arrows, and these mean something, you know, out of this world, something different, there's some spiritual meanings and all that. But I think we have to recognize there was no other way he could have discussed that for them, to reveal for them. To understand this will be a battle, it will be a war, and the implements of war will be destroyed, and they'll be used as fuel. Well, if you did it today, as we were saying, you know, if you put all that nuclear material and and gas and oil and so forth, that you you could, yeah, seven years you could heat a lot of homes, you know, in that process. So I think I have no problem that we would say that the actual outward implements of war would be according to what they are in that day. 
the only way they could understand it in Ezekiel's day was in what they knew as far as implements of war. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm just trying to understand as to why uh, we needed 38 and 39. People have already gone through severe things, and we see Gog and Magog. I mean, trying to figure out in which way they kind of rejoiced in the fact that Israel was going through all this afflictions and troubles. So why did what was specific about Gog and Magog, you know, what guarantee that the people will now, even now, understand? So how come the Lord, actually the Lord is actually now, you know, bringing up the whole thing to an end? Why did he bring in Gog and Magog? I think as a final witness and testimony, but also think, and I want to discuss for a moment, that it's very possible he wanted this uh, as an instrument to clarify some things later in the scripture. You know, to tie some things that he wants to reveal later for us. But I think it's a it's a demonstration to them that know what I what I said I will do. And he's demonstrated that before. I said they will not ever again be possessed by a foreigner. And I'm gonna show you with one final demonstration that that's the case. That's how I would I would see it, but I think it, we have, may have further ramifications, and part of that comes in the question of when did it happen. And I say I don't think that's necessarily the concern of the passage. You know, the identity of people and when it all happened. Except it's very clear. You know, in in the last days and after many years and in the future. I mean, we have as we see in 38 and 39 a number of those types of uh, time phrases which we haven't had a great deal to this point which I think places shows us where the emphasis is being placed here uh, upon these things that we we've seen that even at the end of you know 36 and beginning of 37 the, we're, we're talking about the end of the end <laughs> if I can put it that way it's again a conceptual concept of restoration and God's plan and working but this is the the fullness of that in, in its fruition. Now, let me say some things about um, this uh, text and where it might, and I underline might, fit. Because if you've read again uh, various commentaries, different articles, so forth, there are a multiplicity of proposals as to where the event of Gog and Magog takes place. I'm not going to talk about all those. You, you go read the text. I've talked about a few of them in my commentary. You can go and read in other commentaries where they list the various ones, whether it be, you know, the uh, that it happens prior to the tribulation, whether it happens in the middle of the tribulation, whether it's at the end of the Battle of Armageddon, whether it's in a transitional time. Uh, between the tribulation and the and the millennium, whether it's in the millennium, etc., there are all different kinds of positions in that. They're always they're all at the end, and there's different arguments for that. And I have discussed all of those at least briefly, and why I feel or what weaknesses I feel there are with different ones of those. And I will also tell you uh, where I am at this point. Okay, uh, uh, it's not something again that we spend a lot of time. I hope we don't spend time being dogmatic about. Uh, I think we can learn, we can listen, we need to explore, we need to ask the text uh, uh, questions of reality. What does it really say? What does it not say? By the way, silence is uh, our argument that sometimes used. We all use it at times. Let me just remind you that silence always argues both ways. I'm arguing from silence, and you have a different opinion. You can argue just as strongly for yours as I can for mine because it's silence. I don't know if you ever thought about that. So uh, I'm not saying it isn't something that's there, but it always argues two ways. Now, we have a. I think the thing that we work with. Okay, what is it here that we may find in reference? in the later part of scripture is there anything in scripture that would help us understand when this takes place so i look for either repetition of uh, picture lessons that are here 
are explicit statements, uh, uh, this is Gog or something like that, if I have that in the scripture. And we have here, uh, that we read in, in Revelation 19, verse 70 uh, following, a, a formidable allusion to the great feast of the people, of the birds, pardon me, of the birds and the wild beast upon these uh, animals. If we come then to chapter, uh, Revelation 19, we read after the discussion of the rider on the white horse and the concept of the second advent, I saw the heavens open and there before me was a white horse and the rider called Faithful and True. With justice he judges and makes war. His eyes are blaze like a blazing fire and on his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him that no one knows but himself. He is dressed in the robe dipped in blood and his name is the word of God. The armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses, dressed in fine linen, white and clean, and out of his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations, and he will rule them with an iron scepter. He treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty, and on his robe and on his thigh he has this name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And I saw an angel standing in the sun who cried in a loud voice to all the birds flying in midair. Come, gather together for the great supper of God so that you may eat the flesh of kings, generals, and mighty men of horses and their riders and the flesh of all people, free and, sl and slaves, small and great. Then I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and all their armies gathered together to make war against the rider on the horse and his army. But the beast was captured and with him the false prophet who had performed miraculous signs on his behalf. And with these signs he had deluded those who had received the mark of the beast and worshipped his image. Two of them were thrown alive into the fiery lake of burning sulfur. The rest of them were killed with the sword that came out of the mouth of the rider on the horse and all the birds gorge themselves on their flesh. Now, we have to, I think it's quite normal and natural to raise the question, why has so specific a transfer of an event been taken out of Ezekiel 39 and we find it in Revelation 19? Is it just by coincidence? Is it by accident? Well, maybe. Is it just to pick up another illusion of, of a battle and a war? Or this is, These are the places of the parallel between Ezekiel and Revelation. Uh, why isn't the name Gog mentioned here? If, this is, uh, if, if the beast, let's say, is Gog at this point. Um, well, I think one could say it could be confusing on the part of John in his revelation that one would automatically come back there and confuse the situation with what was happening with the beast. Uh, that's a possibility. Uh, I can't tell you why that would not be mentioned. It does appear that there is some relationship, perhaps, or most likely, between the events in Gog and Magog in 39, 38 and 39, and in the defeat of the hordes in Revelation 19 by the coming of the Son of God, and uh, he defeats them. In, in Ezekiel, we were simply told that God, I, Yahweh, will defeat them. Certainly don't have any problems that Yahweh and Jesus are the same people. You know, it certainly should not present a problem to us in that sense. And that the result of this battle uh, is what we see in Ezekiel uh, 38, because we're not given a specific time period nor a specific context, which would be in Revelation 19, perhaps a greater and more clear context of exactly where this would be and where it would relate. 
and that uh, this is the picture of the coming out uh, with the, the beast with the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against here the emphasis against God but uh, in in the book of Ezekiel we see that it's also against the security and the peacefulness of the people in the land that's one option as we go on in uh, the book of uh, and, and part not the book in the chapter we go to chapter 20 uh, we have a uh, we have the situation of uh, the thousand years that take place and uh, here and then the at the end of the thousand years at verse 7 when the thousand years are over Satan will be released from his prison and will go out to deceive the nations in the four corners of the earth Gog and Magog to gather them for battle in number they are like the sand of the seashore they march across the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of God's people the city he loves but fire came down from heaven and devoured them and the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of burning sulfur where the beast and the false prophet had been thrown and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever I'm always uh, interested if you read uh, commentaries regardless of who you read. Liberal, conservative, critic, whatever. Any commentaries on Ezekiel. There will always be at least a little parenthesis that says compare Revelation 20 verse 7 and following. And I'll always say, well, go right ahead. <laughs> you know, wh why are you putting this in the parenthesis? You obviously have recognized that there's an explicit statement, Gog and Magog, and you do nothing with it. You know, just, oh, by the way, you know, the, refer to that, you know, and, and then they go on with whatever their argument is, uh, whether it's, so to speak, for or against or whatever. And, and that puzzles me because the, the point is, that some they recognize right off that that name Gog and Magog is in that passage and they don't do anything with it I, th I don't I, I don't think we can do that as exegetes we, we come to the text and we got to say who yeah there it is right plain as day G-O-G -G, you know I mean it's there M-A-G-O-G -G, you know we got them both I can't ignore that. I can't say, no, 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 no. That must be G-O-D or, you know, something else. You know, I, I got to come here, you know, put something over that. You know, I got to get rid of it. Uh, it's there. So we have to deal with it. And I think it's fairly explicit. Satan will be released and they'll go and deceive the nations of the earth, Gog and Magog, to, to gather them for battle. You know? Now, this is interesting. I... If this, obviously, we got to go back and look at uh, Ezekiel 38 and 39. God drags him out with a hook in his jaws. Gog, we're told, makes plans in his schemes. There's God's sovereign working. There's his response. And this would imply that Satan is there pushing Gog along. He's gathering him to go do this. So we got all the participants involved in the process of this uh, event. They gather together for battle and the number is like the sand of the seashore. I mean, certainly we don't have any tension here. It was the hordes back in Ezekiel 38 and 39. And they marched across the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of God's people. Well, by that, in other words, they came from all corners. We already seen back in Ezekiel, they come from all different parts of the world and they come together and they march against Jerusalem. Now we say, well, but we don't have a Jerusalem mentioned in uh, Ezekiel 38 and 39. Well, we have the mountains of Israel, and that's exactly where Jerusalem is, right in the mountains. You know, and we have to be careful that we have to, you know, unless it's explicitly there, it's not there. Let's look at, at the comparison. <laughs> now, I could spend a lot more time discussing the similarities and so forth, but I think my understanding of this is, I, and the way I would understand this is I think that Revelation 19 
And in Revelation 20, those passages both are outworkings of that concept that's given to us in 38 and 39. Of the final attempt to defeat the people of Israel, to take possession of the land, to thwart the work of God, to show that he is unfaithful and that he doesn't keep what he says. We have that manifested in the two great enemies of God. The two final people that try to thwart the work of God. The beast who is the chief um, function, he's the chief manifest uh, warrior for Satan and then the boss gets involved, Satan himself. Both of them tried to do this. Both of them were unsuccessful. And this has been demonstrated to us in Ezekiel 38 and 39. I think they're both manifestations. I think that's again part of that unfolding and coming to the fruition of the concept and the truth that has been delivered to us back in the book of Ezekiel. Now, I've had people get all upset with multiple fulfillments and all those kind of things. As I already told you, multiple fulfillment things, I just... I don't even like to talk of it that way anymore. I think we've got to look at it in the sense of the conceptual aspect as the Hebrew prophets did and the fruition and the fullness. But if that's true, then the events, when did these events happen? Well, I think uh, in those situations. Did uh, these would put you right at the second advent and in the millennial context towards the end of it. Two different manifestations of the events of Ezekiel 38 and 39. Now, I'll be quick to tell you, I'm not going to the stake for this, okay? Uh, because uh, we have limited data. But I cannot ignore a very clear allusion in Revelation 19. I've got to deal with it somewhere. Nor an explicit statement in Revelation 20. And I'm amazed how often that happens even among our evangelical friends. How they ignore one or the other and don't really deal with them. We would expect that perhaps of people that think all this is a bunch of picture symbols and you can do whatever you want to with it and ignore it or do away with it in a thousand years either is or it isn't and, and all that stuff, you know. But I'm really surprised at times with some of my evangelical friends that just either ignore both of them or one of them in the process. And then we'll try to put this at times like in the middle of the tribulation. How can I ever put this in the middle of the tribulation? They're living at peace and safety in the land with unwalled villages and they have no problems? That's not what I read of in the book of the Revelation about the tribulation. Doesn't sound too peaceful, peaceful to me and very secure. You know, that's like a saying, I'm going to go live in the Middle East right now in peace and safety and security. I don't think so. So, uh, you don't have to hold my position. <laughs> okay? This is where I am in my study and where I've worked. And again, as far as the details of that, I don't know that it's profitable for us to go into details. You can read those things. You can read my heresies uh, in, the, in the text. Okay. Uh, and there is there are a lot of other different positions, and uh, you can read about them also as well. But if there is a time factor, that's where I'd put it. I think we have uh, two final great manifestations of the concept of the last attempt to thwart the work of God and to show that he's not faithful to what he says. And this, these are in the concept that we see in Revelation of the beast, 19, and in uh, Satan, in 20. Yes? Mm -hmm. So just to clarify, you think that um, Satan is Gog, or Gog is a nation motivated by Satan? Uh, the text basically kind of implies, I just flipped it back, let me see. Uh, it implies... That you have there, you know, he gathers them for battle, Gog and Magog. Which would imply that uh, 
he is the one who is doing this. He's, and uh, here we have argument to say, in a sense, there, there is a satanic working behind the working of Gog. I mean, it seems that's to me what the text is saying. But in that sense, it's really uh, a manifestation of what Satan wants to accomplish. He's using the tool of God for that. Is that your same? I read your article, Fresh Look at Ezekiel and the Evangelical Theological Society. Is that the same? I hope I didn't misunderstand the article, but is that the same stance you had there? Yes. Yeah. Uh, I think so. That was done a long time ago. You don't expect me to remember that a long time ago. <laughs> I, the reason I hesitate that book because I know I, I wrote a commentary for Moody Press and I've changed a number of things in there. Because it seemed like, at least, I don't know if I misunderstood it, it seemed like you were saying that God was representative of Satan and may God was representative of the nations that he was. Not a direct uh, parallel, but a stronger one than uh -huh. that. I I think I would have some, if I said that, which I may well have, uh, I would uh, probably back away from that a little bit to say that, that I think the text is basically saying he's using Gog as, a, as an instrument and a tool. But it's obviously his intent and his working and his, his plan to do these things. Okay. See, that's where you get in trouble when you write stuff a long time ago. You forget what you wrote. No, you're not there yet. I know you're not old enough to forget what you wrote. Okay. But uh, it can happen. Okay. Well, this brings us to chapter 40. We can talk about that for a little bit. We can get uh, started into this. Uh, chapter 40 is our last uh, group of messages. And uh, if we look on our chronological timeline here we're at 573 now what this means is that these visions that were received the night before the fugitive came to declare that Jerusalem's fallen as I think you can see would be an encouragement it gives hope to the exiles to know that the land Yes, they're separated from it, but if they're obedient to God's way in the Mosaic Covenant, they can return. There will The false shepherds will be gone. There, God is going to bring the Messiah to rule over them. He's going to remove the foreign possessors. He's going to remove them and prepare the land and cleanse it for them and make it beautiful. And then he will restore them. This is all the work of God. Not, not the work of the people. He will regather them. He will bring them back. And he mentions that and then illustrates it with the vision of the dry bones in the valley. He will unite the nations. Once again, there'll be one nation. There will no longer be Israel and Judah. And all of their covenants will be there and he will establish a covenant of peace. They will live in perfect security. And he's done all that before he comes to the situation of 38 and 39. We're already at the end time because it's in the future. It's already in the place of the time when they're living in perfect safety and security. And then he points out to them, and though there will be one last try, they won't be successful. So guys, what I've told to you, that I, you, once, you are at that, once the, my people are at that time, I'm telling you, they will never again be dispersed and the land will never again be possessed by anyone else. And I'm demonstrating this to you very clearly in the situation of Gog and Magog. And then the next morning, Jerusalem's fallen. That's what you hear. But you now have hope of what lies ahead at the time you receive the sad news and God's marvelous grace. Now, if you'll notice, this is taking place at 586, right at the time of the, you know, well, just, you know, a few months after that time, of the time the fugitive gets there. And the next 40 to 48 is going to be in 573. So we have approximately a 13-year gap with no messages by Ezekiel. What was he doing that time? I don't know. Okay? You can go ask him when you're there. 
I'm going to ask him. Oh, I want to know what was he doing. You know, what, what, how these, were these guys responding? Because, but he's still around. And he still is going to have a message for them in chapters 40 to 48, which is, again, uh, apocalyptic type of uh, literature that we're working with. And it's in the 25th year of their exile. It's not the last message that he will give. Remember the last message he gave was the final fall of Egypt that will be the payment to Nebuchadnezzar for the uh, 13 years of siege of Tyre and that's in 571. At that point we know no more about Ezekiel. The book is closed. Whether he lived longer than that, whether he ministered longer than uh, than a 22-year period from 593 to 571, we don't know. Uh, we only get our information from the book he's given us and the chronological notices he's, that, he's, that he's given to us there. Now, uh, here we have uh, the situation. And we're going to talk here about... Uh, First of all, chapters 40 to 42, which deal with the temple, okay? A temple that is going to be built. Now, there will be a description that will be given in detail that in which the glory of God in chapter 43 will return. Okay, the people are right back in the land. We know that in, in, in 36 and following. Back in the land, living securely and peaceful, Gog and Magog have tried and failed. And now we suddenly come here and we jump into a situation where let me, it's as if, let me describe now what this is going to be like at the end time. Uh, there will be a new temple that will be constructed. And so we have a description in these chapters of the temple, the, the return of the glory of God, the sacrificial system of worship that will take place in that temple and priestly functions that go along with that. We will have tribal and, and priestly allotments of a land which will be topographically different. Topography will be different. Now is this in the is this in the millennium? Is this in the eternal state? Is this a new heaven and a new earth? Well guys we're right back at it again and, and I hope uh, I hope this is helpful to you, not confusing, but we've got to think Hebraic. We've got to recognize, if you go read Isaiah, and you read uh, chapters uh, in the 60s of Isaiah, for example, and you get Isaiah talking about the kingdom and the future and the so forth. And at one moment you think, well, that sounds like what, you know, probably what is the millennial kingdom. The next one, nope, I'm in the eternal state. Nope. I mean, the new heaven and the new earth. You know, they're all, they're all kind of in the pot together. And uh, I would not be dogmatic to say that what we have in 4048 must be the millennium. But as I look at what is revealed there and what is revealed to us in Revelation uh, 21 and 22 about the new heavens and the new earth and what we know uh, in Ezekiel 40 to 48, I see some similarities and I see some differences. <coughs> that doesn't bother me. I think the similarities are the fact that we're, we're in the end time. We're, it, we are there. And the things that are similar to the millennium are similar to the eternal state. There's a lot of similarities. It's not like, you know, we suddenly, well, this, hope you guys like this one. Now we're going to change it all. No. But there are differences. Whether you view that as a progression, in other words, you, you start with the uh, millennial kingdom and then there are gradual developments and so forth that go on and as, as we go into the eternal state and the, the, the eternal messianic kingdom. Or, as I think, I've come to the place, at least at this point in my thinking, that the millennium is like a, a preview. It's like the preface of the eternal state. After all, it's only a thousand years. That's peanuts, man, to eternity. So it's just, it's a, it's kind of a preface. Here 
is uh, just to kind of get you started here, here's what it's going to be like. And, but, this, but the millennium has its purposes in the conclusion of things on this earth as well. And the, then we go to new heavens and new earth and so forth as we come into Revelation 22. Uh, so I, I see it more as kind of a, a preview, a, a preface. Very similar, but there are some differences. The differences are, are not great, but there are differences. You know, the, the river that's going to flow flows out of the temple in Ezekiel, and it's going to throw from, flow from uh, God's presence. You don't have a temple in the new heavens and the new earth. Okay? So, the same thing like that would tend to have me move it more forward before those things have obviously been removed. That's why I would tend to move it more to what we would tend to say might be the millennial aspect rather than the end. But it's not all as def nicely defined with all, you know, this happens here and this happens here and this happens here. And that's just what we have to live with uh, as we work with the text. So uh, we have all these things. And I think the basic thrust of Ezekiel 40, 48 of the things he's going to talk about. There's a temple. There's the glory of God that returns and fills that temple. There is a worship system. And we'll talk about these things. It's a, it involves a sacrificial system. Not to save anybody, I hope. By the way, I hope you realize the sacrifices never did save anybody. Ever. They were always pictorial and descriptive. So why can't they still be that in a memorial sense? Mm -hmm. And that's that question. I mean, Hebrews makes it clear that once the fullness has come, the shadow is done away with. In light of like Hebrews teaching on the whole like type and then the, the reality, like I just really wrestle with especially since death is the consequence of sin, and Paul makes such a point that in the resurrection, in, in Christ's resurrection, death has been done up and done away with and defeated, that we're still going to be killing animals and watching death, which only exists as a result of sin. Like, for what purpose, or theologically, how does that fit in with, with well, everything else we're talking about in the New Testament? Uh, we'll talk about that, okay, in the process. I'll ask you, why are you going to celebrate the Lord's table then? Because it's talking about death. Okay. So the same sort of questions we have to ask across the board. So these things are there. We will talk about those things. I, I think the question, of course, that puzzles everybody in these chapters and people raise is, what does it all mean? And that's, that's certainly a legitimate, legitimate question. That's what we want to, to, to deal with in these. Should these chapters be interpreted uh, in a normal grammatical way or should it all be figurative because it tends to be apocalyptic and uh, some of my uh, good Amil friends would say to the latter yes it should all be symbolic and figuratively and then I try to get them to tell me what then they represent boy you start getting all over the ballpark at that point um, in fact uh, to one of my friends, I said, you know, look, if you just take the temple, for example. We do know in the Old Testament, the temple is a, is a vis as I've said to you, it's a visual reminder, visual representation of God's presence. That doesn't mean there's not a literal temple. There is. That temple was in itself a picture. When you come to the New Testament, it still has that concept. Paul talks about our temples as the body of the Holy Spirit. It's where God resides within. It's a vision. The church is the temple of God. Okay? Uh, we talk about the temple and the quotation from Zechariah that's an actual physical temple. I said, which one does it mean? And what the response was? All of them. I don't know. You know? It, so, uh, uh, somehow that leaves me a little unsatisfied in the process. When I read, beginning in chapter 40, that, uh, you know, he says, in the 25th year of the exile, the beginning of the year, on the 10th of the month, in the 14th year after the fall of the city, on the very day, on that very day, the hand of the Lord was upon me, and he took me there in visions of God. So we're in a vision here. He took me there to the land of Israel and set me on a very high mountain on the south side where some buildings that looked like a city. Okay? 
So he's taken to he's taken to the land of Israel, and he's on a high, very high mountain, whose south, uh, whose on whose south side, were some buildings that looked like a city. And he took me there, and I saw a man whose appearance was like bronze, who was standing in the gateway with a linen cord, and a measuring rod in his hand. And he said to me, "Son of man." Look with your eyes and hear with your ears and pay attention to everything I'm going to show you. For that is why you have been brought here. Tell the house of Israel everything you see. Well, I walk away from that and I say, well, he's on a mountain there. I don't know which mountain. It's a very high one. A height is a relative thing. I hope you understand that. There are no very high mountains in Israel. You know, the highest the elevation gets on the west side of the, of the Jordan River is about 2,000 feet. And that's up north in the upper Galilee. If you want to get on the other side and get up there to Mount Hermon, you can go up to 9,000 feet. But it doesn't exactly sound to me like he's sitting on Mount Hermon. Okay? So I'm not sure which is the very high mountain in that case. And there's a city on the south side of it. I don't, it doesn't tell us what the city is. It doesn't say it's in a particular name. But this is our setting. This is our location. We know the time when this is done. And we know the recipient is Ezekiel. And we have one who is his guide and director. And is saying to him, uh, I have a measuring rod in my hand. We're going to go do some measurements. And what you see and what you hear Listen carefully, look carefully, because I want you to tell everything you see to the people of Israel. Well, I would get the idea that he really wants me to look at uh, some specifics here. Okay? And when I start reading the text, so I begin to read the text, and I saw a wall completely surrounding the temple area. The length of the measuring rod in the man's hand was six long cubits, each which was a cub cubit and a hand breadth. Okay, you know what a cubit is? From here to here, okay? And what is a, a hand span? Okay, put this on the end. And that's how long the cubit is, okay? So it's about like this. Okay? That's the way they had to measure in those days. Actually, it's not too bad a way. But uh, he had the cubit to measure, and he used the long cubit in this case. And uh, he measured the wall, and it was uh, one measuring rod thick and one rod high. Okay? Because it's six long cubits. So you take this and you do six times, and you have this wall that's uh, one rod thick and one rod high. It's basically square if you were to look at the cross section of it. Okay? And he went to the gate facing east, and he climbed its steps and measured the threshold of the gate, which was one rod deep. And the alcoves for the guards were one rod long, one rod wide, and the projecting walls between the alcoves were five cubits thick. And the threshold of the gate next to the portico facing the temple was one rod deep. Then he measured the portico with the gateway, and it was eight cubits deep, and its jams were two cubits thick. And the portico of the gate faced the temple, and on and on. Now, if the temple just has a general concept, and we're supposed to understand it as some general concept, I have a question. Okay? Why all the details for three chapters? Why all the measurements? Yes, I think the holistic concept here is, you know, you end up with a temple. And by the way, we've got a pretty good floor plan. No, we don't have the superstructure, but we have a pretty good floor plan. But if, he could have said this in one sentence. We don't need three chapters, <laughs> you know, to give us all the detailed floor plans of a temple. Unless he revealed that for some reason. Whether I understand what it is or not, you know, it, it, it doesn't make sense that we have done all this for naught. Because it really doesn't make any difference. All the concern was that there was a temple. 
I think you could do it in a lot less in the space than that is used. So I have to walk away, so to speak, from the text and say, he wrote this down and he told Ezekiel, you tell it to everything you see. Ezekiel's right there watching, you know, this is one cubit, that's one rod, this was, uh, you know, and he, poor guy, man, I can't see him taking notes, <laughs> you know, on this thing, wow, you know. Uh, and he's supposed to tell that to the people, why? Why tell them? You know, after he starts telling them, well, as, like I was reading, I'm sure the, the guys back there in exile say, hey, enough, guy, because it doesn't make any difference to us at all. All we want to know is there's going to be a temple. Don't, don't confuse me with the details, you know. My mind's made up as a temple. Okay? So, I have to come away from that that there is some significance and the only thing that makes significance is that you've got a temple. And it has specifics to it. This is not, if anything's going to argue that it's not figuratively to be taken, this is it. And all of my dear Amelio friends have absolutely nothing to say about these three chapters except it's a temple, which can mean, as I just told you, one of them said to me, all of these things. Yeah. Then why door jams? Why priestly rooms? Why thresholds? Why the descriptions on the walls? Why the spacing between the alcoves and the... Why the fact that the... The inner court, you know, you have a hundred meters square, and you know, and you go, and we can go on and on. Why? It just seems like a waste of time. So I understand this as a temple that he's describing for that time, and this is the dimensions of that temple and how it will be, because that's the normal, natural. Uh, a interpretive approach to the text. That's what he saw. Okay? He saw a literal floor plan dimensions of a temple. I think that these chapters as a whole, from 40 to 48, because it's interrelated, because in part you're going to have to have the temple for the glory of God to return to. And when you come to 43, and also for the priest to function in, as you go to 44, 45, 46, and then you got a river that's going to flow out of it. So, I mean, it's, it is rather crucial to the whole of those eight chapters. Uh, I think what he is, uh, in, why at this point, you know, at 573, I don't know of a circumstance or a situation which they would ask. No, at the, I'm not aware of what that would be, except that perhaps they were into the, and, and this is purely a hypothesis on my part, speculation. Perhaps they were into the, ex into the exile. Now they've been there in that situation for 13 years. They've pretty well got an idea of what it's like. Of which, by the way, we don't know a whole lot about the Babylonian captivity. But they know what it's like. And perhaps their uh, hope has waned and perhaps also their concept of worship and the importance of a relationship with God has, is beginning to wane. Because remember in the, in the return from the Babylonian captivity when you come to the book of Haggai, or if you read in Ezra and you come to chapter 5, verses 1 and 2, and it says God raised up Haggai and Zechariah to encourage them to continue to build the temple. Why was it so important that they build a temple when they come back from Babylonian captivity? Anybody? They would not commit spiritual adultery again. Well, I think he certainly didn't want them to commit spiritual adultery. I personally think it's because of what the temple represented mm -hmm. to them. The temple, again, was the visual presence of God with them and the significance of their relationship with him. That's the visual place of where they related. And that's why it was so important that they rebuild the temple. Not because, oh, we need a nice temple and, you know, let's go spend some big bucks and get a nice glorious temple. No, it was a message to them that was communicated that God's 
they need to restore their relationship with him. Even at that point is the discussion about the glory of the temple. Even in their return then from Babylonian captivity. And that the glory and that temple would be more glorious uh, than Solomon's temple. Because uh, the signet ring of, Ze of Zerubbabel would, come, would be in that temple. Which has to refer to the Messiah. Okay. It, it's a picture to them, again, keep in mind they think descriptively and pictorial, of the importance of their relationship. And as they build the temple, that they would be reminded they need to make sure that their relationship as a people and as individuals is right with God. Because that's how they got to where they were in captivity, by not maintaining that relationship and not obeying Him. And I think perhaps when we come to the situation uh, in, uh, in 40 to 48, as they're now 13 years into the captivity, he is reminding them at that point the importance of the visual, of, the of your relationship with God, which is manifested in the visual representation of the temple. It will remind you of that. And I want, you, I want to encourage you that uh, there will be and there is coming, the temple will be restored, and there will be worship, and there will be uh, change as, uh, in God's fulfillment of his working as you come to the end time. Now, that's, I, I, I readily, as I preface that, I don't really know what they were thinking, but perhaps that could be the reason for that. But I do see this as a real temple. I, I don't understand Otherwise, why all the details? You have the east gate, you have the outer gate, you have the north gate, you have the south gate. You, you know, you have the comparisons of all these. He goes through uh, the inner gates and he goes to the room where you prepare the sacrifices and the rooms for the priest and, and so forth. I mean, the, it's, in, it's in detail. And so I have to understand that is essentially this is the temple that will exist at that time. This, that I would put this temple in the millennial time because in the eternal stage I mentioned it, there is not one there. Okay, But I, it's a floor plan for somebody. Either that or it's sure a lot of wasted ink in, in the process. Um, and I, I don't think it would be very edifying for you for me to tell you that each thing has certain dimensions. Okay, Please read it yourself. I mean, I could spend a lot of time doing that. But I don't know about you. I think I, if I started doing that, I think I'd take a nap and I'd wait till I finished. Because it's not one of those things that's just really exhilarating. You know, to know how many, how many cubits and how many rods and so forth, everything is taking place at this point. So I won't do that. I won't bore you with those dimensions. And I'm not trying to bypass the chapters real quickly, but that's what we'd have to end up doing. Okay. Um, I, I don't have a diagram here with me of uh, laying out what's written. You can find it if you look in my commentary. Uh, it's, and by the way, there's different ones that have been done at a student at Western Seminary. Uh, <clears throat> who has written a book in conjunction with Carl Laney. I don't know if you've looked at that at all, about uh, the uh, Ezekiel's temple. Done a lot of research, talked to a lot of rabbis and so forth, and has drawn his, um, he actually has made a model of the temple. And you have to recognize when you make a model of this, you're going to have to do some subjective speculation. Because uh, you, you can have the floor plan, but that doesn't necessarily tell you what's up there on the roof. <laughs> You know, if this is a one-dimensional plans, but the detail of it, I think it's sufficient to say that somebody wants somebody to know exactly how this thing's going to be laid out. Okay, So those types of things are interesting to read and to look at, and there are different people that uh, debate over some of the minor dimensions and minor relationships, and some of the, the text and some of the words it uses. You're not really quite sure if it's uh, at, you know, it projects exactly right at this corner or right over here. But those are minor. The basic uh, plan, interesting, if you look at the plans of the temple done by different people, they're essentially the same. 
whoever any, it makes any difference who who draws those. And he also gives the description of the uh, altar that is t uh, to be there for them. Uh, in, in addition to the rooms of the priest, he gives uh, that as well, as far as what the dimensions of the altar would be. So you have the temple itself, inside the inner court, inside the outer court, and the dimensions of the whole complex. Each of the rooms that go around the outer court, where the places are, they make the sacrifices, rooms, and so forth. It's all given given to us in these chapters. So for your bed, uh, you know, your your nighttime reading tonight, please read chapters 40 to 40, through 42, and I can probably guarantee you'll be asleep before you get to the end of 42. <laughs>